in the process right now of taking a look at the future, the type of capabilities that we need to provide uh, for the joint force. And it's not just uh, new equipment, although that's important. It's it's new doctrine, it's new organizations, it's new ways we're going to train. It's a 21st century uh, talent management uh, system. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today our guest is General James McConville, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff. Before that, he was Vice Chief, and he served in a number of distinguished commands uh, for the Army, including combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to be talking today with General McConville about uh, the future for the Army, the path forward as it thinks about modernization. But uh, John McConville, I want to begin with some issues that are immediate on everybody's minds, and then we'll broaden our discussion to thinking about the future. And let me ask you about, about the decision that's the most immediate for the Army and our country, and that's uh, the war in Afghanistan. We have a deadline of May 1 that was set by the previous administration for withdrawal of U.S. troops. We're getting awfully close to that. What kind of guidance are you giving to your forces, to your uh, staff about, about what's ahead and how quickly, once a decision is made to withdraw our forces, can we do that in practical terms? Well, thank, but first of all, David, thanks, thanks for having me uh, here today. And, and I know there's a lot of interest in, in what is happening uh, in Afghanistan. And, you know, the administration is, is leading with policy. Um, they're going to shape it with diplomacy and then the military uh, will execute uh, those orders. Uh, they're in the process right now. There's multiple uh, contingencies, and, and once those decisions are made at the highest level, we'll be ready to execute. So I had a good chance to talk with the Secretary of State Blinken last week about Afghanistan, and I heard loud and clear that, that he, and more important, the president, wants those troops out, that he, truly he can't imagine them being there uh, next year. Um, the, I think the question I want to ask you in a practical uh, sense is whether it's, it's possible to, to get them out quickly uh, and whether it's possible to get all the equipment that we brought in to support them out at the same time. Well, it's all, it's all about physics. Um, it comes down to how many people you need to move, uh, how much equipment you need to move. Uh, and you know, the commanders uh, in the field uh, have, have those uh, type of contingency plans, and uh, they'll be able to uh, advise uh, the senior leaders in the administration how long that takes, and uh, I, I, those plans are available right now. And, and I want to just ask you a couple more questions before we, we leave uh, Afghanistan. If that May 1 deadline passes, and it, it sure looks uh, likely to me, uh, you don't need to comment on that, but I, I, I do wonder if our forces in Afghanistan will then become vulnerable to attack. Taliban generally is held off on, on attacks since the agreement was reached for this May 1 final de departure. Uh, is General Miller, your commander in Kabul, uh, and other uh, senior commanders, are, are they preparing for the possibility that they could come under significant attack uh, over the next weeks and months? Well, when it comes to General Miller, I don't think there's any finer combat leader uh, in the United States Army. He's got a very distinguished career. He cares about his troops. Uh, and you know, we're all going to make sure that our troops are taken care of and uh, have the proper defense uh, mechanisms in place to uh, take care of their troops. And that's certainly on the top of his mind. So uh, a final uh, question, uh, General McConville. You served in Afghanistan. Uh, this has been, as, as we often remind ourselves, uh, sadly, America's 
uh, longest uh, war. I'm curious, as you think back on your deployments in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, what the lessons are for you as a commander and as a, as a, as a person of this long period of, of difficult combat uh, assignments. What's your, what's your takeaway as you think about this? And when, when younger uh, soldiers, men and women, ask you, uh, General, give us your sense of, of, of what this all means, how do you answer that? Well, I think, you know, when we take a look at what's going around the world, uh, many of these uh, conflicts are, are, are going to continue until we get the appropriate uh, political solution. And, and you know, one of the big takeaways is just how important security provided by uh, the country uh, it, it is. And, you know, I've had three of my kids have served in Afghanistan, two sons and a daughter. And so I know what it means to send uh, our sons and daughters uh, off, off to combat. They've done an incredible job. Uh, they've, uh, they've basically um, prevented Al-Qaeda from attacking our country again. Uh, but there's much, much more work uh, that's going to be need to be done in, in Afghanistan. It will have given the Afghan uh, a, a start in doing that. And it's going to end with some type of political agreement. And when you talk to your to your own uh, kids uh, who serve there and uh, and other other young people who who served and have uh, risked their lives, what what do you uh, tell them? This mission really has been about. What is the thing that they've put their necks on the line for? Uh, as you try to explain it, as your kids would explain it. Yeah, I think you know we, we take a look at it. Our country was attacked on 9/11. Um, and we, we knew uh, who did it. Uh, we knew where they were. And by going to Afghanistan, we had uh, we were able to hold those who did it accountable. Uh, we were also able to prevent um, Al Qaeda from being operational from that sanctuary uh, over the last 20 years. And and that's the contribution uh, they made uh, to world security by going and, and volunteering to serve and uh, very, very proud of this generation of how they continue to raise their right hands and, and say, send me. So I'm extremely proud of the young men and women today. Thank, thank you for, for, for sharing that. Let's turn to uh, another tough subject, uh, which is the uh, insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th uh, with uh, Chairman uh, Milley's uh, uh, direction, support, uh, the, the military has been looking hard uh, at, at the role of, of uh, uh, the, the military family, uh, veterans, reserves, uh, even active duty personnel, whether they had any involvement in that January 6th uh, uh, insurrection, uh, what we all watched on television. What are you learning, uh, General McConville, as, as you do your uh, analysis about the links between the Army, uh, the Army family, and, and what happened on Capitol Hill? Well, I think uh, what it starts with is within the Army is we, we want to be a cohesive team where everyone treats everyone with big respect and they take care of each other. And you know, we don't have harmful, harmful behaviors uh, like extremism, like sexual harassment, sexual assault, like racism. Uh, in our force because you know, we, we have to go out and earn the trust of the American people every single day. We should never take that for granted. And if we have soldiers who taint our organization uh, by doing those things that are harmful uh, to the country, um, that is not uh, what we want to see. Uh, we have millions of people that have served the United States Army over the many years that have fought heroically uh, for their country and when people do harmful things like that it taints their service so we have no room uh, for extremism uh, in, in our force and that does not mean that pe people can have their their beliefs their, their their own political or religious beliefs however uh, there's no role for, for anyone uh, trying to overthrow the government or having you know in, in type of uh, in, in the military to do something like that uh, one of your uh, colleagues, uh, General McKenzie, Marine Corps General, who's the uh, commander of CENTCOM, uh, told me, and I, I quoted him in the Washington Post, saying, 
any commander who doesn't think there's some of this extremism, some of this white nationalism in his unit, doesn't know his unit. You, you've commanded an awful lot of troops. Would you say something similar? What, what's your sense, uh, thinking back on, on the assignments you've had and the, the troops serving with you? Well, I think uh, one is too many. You know, I don't, I, I look and, you know, we certainly have a task force that takes a look at um, those type of uh, behavior and, and, you know, the numbers are not very big at all, but that doesn't mean that's not there. And uh, we are very concerned about having any type of harmful behaviors that break the trust of the American people in our organization. The American people have got to trust uh, their army and we got to make sure that we provide the force that allows them to do that. And in terms of vetting new recruits to make sure that people, you know, subscribe to values we share in common uh, as Americans, don't have values that, that are extreme and dangerous, are you going to be doing new things in the vetting? And are you going to be doing new things uh, while people are serving uh, during their service to, to make sure that these ideas uh, are, are not uh, underground, invisible, but there. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, gets back to the core of the United States Army, which is uh, being a cohesive team where everyone treats everyone with big respect and everyone takes care of each other. And it's, it's, you know, keeping the trust of the American people. So these type of behaviors, you know, we don't want our army and we don't want them to stay in our army. And so, we're going to take the appropriate measures that uh, that, that we can uh, to make sure that um, the 99.999 percent of people that believe in what we're about are able to serve with dignity and respect. And uh, General, before we, we leave the question of what happened at the Capitol, I, I want to ask what role the uh, Army, the National Guard, are are, are playing today um, here in April. In, in any continuing presence, we saw folks come out pretty darn quick when that car rammed into uh, the barricade, tragically killing a member of the Capitol Police uh, a week or so ago. Uh, your folks are still are still there in, in a National Guard capacity. How long do you expect that will continue? Well, we don't know. Uh, as you said, uh, the, the National Guard has done a fabulous job uh, really around the country and also uh, in the Capitol, uh, they were there on the 20th of January. Um, and what we will do is, is uh, whatever is approved by the Secretary of Defense, we'll provide uh, the appropriate uh, security forces. They are working very, very closely uh, with the Capitol Police, uh, as well as other law enforcement agencies in the District of Columbia to make sure we have the uh, appropriate presence, given the idea that, that most agree that the military should only be used in law enforcement as a last resort. One question that keeps being asked um, is, is why it took the Guard so long to get to the Capitol uh, as that afternoon of January 6th wore on and the perimeter had been breached and the horrible scenes of people inside. It's been argued that the military's uh, response in getting the National Guard there was too slow. Is that a bum rap in your view? Uh, it's often enough in the papers. Do you think that's just just misguided? Well, right, well, right now there's there's an investigation, so I want to get in front of the investigation that's going to come out and and, and lay that out. But you know, I, I do like to look at 20 uh, January, uh, which was the inauguration day, and I got a chance to see. What happens where you have a lead federal agency uh, in charge with a integrated security plan that brings all the interagency partners together? I got to see what it looks like when you do an interagency uh, rehearsal where all the players are there so they understand who's going to do what. I got a chance to see what a rehearsal looks like uh, for all the National Guard uh, members that came in so they had a chance to rehearse all the contingencies that, that, that they may see. And uh, I think that is a model for how we should do things in the future, because there's many different organizations uh, that are involved in providing uh, law enforcement for the district. Before we turn to modernization, uh, one more question about, about right now. Uh, we're still struggling 
to bring the COVID-19 pandemic under control. Uh, the order of the day uh, is vaccination, and a lot of Americans are, are being vaccinated. A lot of members of the, of the U.S. Army are, are being vaccinated, but not all. And the numbers seem to be below, well below 50 percent. And I'm wondering uh, what you think that can or, or should be done about that. The president, it's my understanding, could order uh, all active duty forces to be vaccinated uh, if uh, he felt there was an emergency that required that. Uh, troops can be ordered to be vaccinated for anthrax, uh, uh, other things. I, I, I know you probably have had to be vaccinated for anthrax in the, in the past. I'm sure that was no fun. Why, why shouldn't uh, we be just issuing an order that active duty uh, military forces need to be vaccinated to protect, uh, to protect the force, to protect uh, its, its readiness? What, why isn't that the answer? Well, I think, first of all, you know, we're taking a look at, at our numbers right now. We're, we're over 700,000 uh, in the Army uh, have had one dose. I think we're about 250 to 260,000 that are fully vaccinated. And what we're seeing is, you know, there's been, I've seen some stories about everyone wants to know who's declining. Uh, what we're seeing is with education and, and quite frankly, as their buddies get uh, the vaccination, we're seeing a lot more uh, participation. And, you know, as we um, go ahead and begin the, the, the vaccination, it, we're very, very aggressive. And if someone doesn't want to get it, the next person standing right there ready to get it. So I think we're going to see uh, a lot more uh, coming forward. I think we're going to see a lot more trust in, in the vaccinations. And as far as whether we need to give an order or not, uh, with the emergency capability, they'll have to work their way through it. But, you know, I, what I would like to see is that all members of, 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 of the Army uh, take a look at being part of a cohesive team and they realize uh, for their uh, brothers and sisters in arms, it's important that we defeat uh, this virus, which is, you know, the biggest threat to the American people uh, that we have right now in the country. And so we have to defeat this virus. We have to get back uh, to uh, business as normal. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to do with our military. And this is causing a lot of friction, although people are doing a great job of overcoming the fog and friction associated with it. An awful lot of people obviously look up to men and women in uniform. Uh, and as more and more members of the Army get vaccinated, um, and I'm encouraged by what you say, that, that there's a kind of demonstration effect that people see it happening and they think, yeah, okay, I'll do that too. Is there a way that, that they can uh, bring that to the, to the public and, and um, show them that their men and women in, in U.S. Army uniforms are getting vaccinated? And think about it, folks. Is there something you could do in terms of public education, do you think, that would help? Well, we're certainly uh, willing to help in whatever manner that they would like us. Uh, I think, you know, we have a lot of both uh, guard uh, reserve and active soldiers out right now manning uh, vaccination points uh, around uh, the country, and, and they are making a significant contribution. So many of the American people are going to go out to, you know, whether it's in many of the states, and they're going to see uh, the military helping the communities um, get people vaccinated. And I think, you know, as we come together, we realize uh, the importance of this. I think as we get more information, uh, people will realize that this is something that we, we, we need to do for a society, uh, we need to do for the team, and, and we need to do for the Army. And I think we need to make sure we, we spend a lot of time on the education process. We want those who've had it uh, to go out and say, hey, it's, it, it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Let's, let's talk about the, the future of the, of the Army. You've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, modernization, what the, the battlefields of 2035 will look like and what the Army's uh, uh, weapons and doctrine sh should should look like. Give our viewers a, an introduction to that uh, examination you've been doing, uh, the, the problems as you see them and the some of the early solutions you're thinking about. Well, well thank you. And, you know, it's that old adage that Generals always want to fight the last fight, or and quite frankly, we don't. Uh, what we want to do in the Army is win the next fight. And we've done a, a lot of 
uh, experimentation and, and, and simulation uh, as part of the joint force. Uh, we recognize that uh, we need a, a, a new joint war fighting concept. We're at an inflection point. Most of the services have been doing irregular warfare, counterinsurgency, and counterterrorism for the last 20 years based on 9 11. And we recognize as we move into an era of great power competition, and I would say great power competition does not mean great power conflict, and the way you avoid that is, is really peace through strength. And that's a strong whole government of effort, but also a strong military, and also very importantly, a strong allies and partners. So when we talk about transforming the army, which I believe needs to happen every 40 years. It happened in 1940 when General Marshall had my job for World War II. It happened in 1980 when I, when I came into the Army. Uh, that's when we did a lot of things from airland battle to our big five modernization efforts to uh, combat training centers to the all-volunteer force. Now we find ourselves in 2020. So we're coming out with new doctrine for the Army, it's multi-domain operations, which is part of the joint warfighting concept. We're working very, very closely uh, with the other chiefs. In fact, um, the, the chief of the uh, chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, General Brown, and uh, CNO of the Navy, Admiral Field Day, we met up in Aberdeen and, and are working together to, to bring forward a combined joint all-domain command control system uh, that will allow us to uh, tie our senses and shoot us all together, and to give us the, the speed, the, the range, and the convergence that we need for decision dominance and, and, and for, for overmatch. And we're building new organizations. Uh, we've built security force assistance brigades, multi-domain task forces. We're training differently, uh, taking advantage of technology with a synthetic training environment. We're using augmented and virtual reality to train our soldiers very, very differently. Uh, we have six modernization priorities, which have not changed, and we are committed uh to developing and fielding and we're doing that very very quickly from long range precision fires to a next generation combat vehicle to future vertical lift to a network that ties everyone together uh, to air missile defense and soldier lethality and we're implementing a 21st century talent management system that's going to compete for the young men and women's talent that's out there that that we need uh to man the army of the future so as always happens in a period of, of change and limited resources, you get some inter-service rivalries about who should do what. That, that certainly happened when missiles first came on the scene and the Army said they were ballistic and the Air Force said, no, 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 they're aeronautic. Uh, and we're getting some of that same conflict now. Um, you've got plans for the Army to have long-range missiles, long-range fires to deal with the battlefield of the future. And just recently, uh, Air Force General General Ray uh, said he thought that idea was stupid when we had uh, bombers that could perform that mission. Just talk a little bit about, about this, um, you know, in, in a sense, a, a turf fight that's gonna take place as we think about uh, how we're gonna do the long range attacks, which, which part of our military should be responsible uh, and how we avoid the frictions that, to be honest, have been so common in, in the past. Well, I think, you know, at, 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 at the end of the day, we're, we're a joint team. And as, as I mentioned, uh, all of the chiefs have uh, talked about this. We've, we're working together. I, I think we all want to win. Uh, we all bring different perspectives. Uh, you, know, it's, it, you know, where you sit sometimes depends on where you stand. Your view of uh, the future fight may uh, be uh, different from your perspective. I have an interesting perspective, um, not only an aviator, but I also had the privilege of commanding an infantry division. So I, I, I try to see other people's perspectives. And what we look at is which are, we're trying to buy options to combatant commanders of things that they can use. Uh, you know, there's sea based, there's air based, and there's also ground based uh, capabilities. Uh, that give that combatant commander multiple options, but also present multiple dilemmas to someone that we're trying to compete against. So they can't focus on just one option uh, that we have. And I think that's the value in having multiple perspectives, multiple options, and multiple dilemmas uh, that we need to have uh, as we live in this, this world of great power competition. So there'll be different perspectives. 
there'll be different opinions that sometimes, uh, you know, people say certain things. Uh, but in the Army, in, in, at the chief level, we're not going down that road. We're really trying to work together. We're really trying to understand. Uh, the American people expect us to, uh, pre to present or to give them the best military they can get for the resources that are available. And, and that's what we're trying to do. One of the things, uh, General McConville, about having uh, such a strong military as the United States uh, does is that we have magnificent uh, uh, existing weapons. People often speak of legacy weapons, the Navy's uh, aircraft carriers, the Army's tanks and ability to use tanks in, in combat. This whole range of, of uh, ways of projecting power but as we think about the future, we know that some of those platforms may not be as relevant in the future as they have been in the past. So the question I want to ask you, and I've, I've asked this with uh, of, of General Brown in the Air Force and uh, 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 Navy commanders uh, going back to Admiral Richardson and, and others, the question is, what are you going to give up? to get the new things that you want. I mean, for example, tank warfare, when I think about the future, it's pretty hard for me to imagine tank battles like what we remember from, from Patton and World War II. That just doesn't seem like the, the future is going to be like that. Yet we have this huge uh, tank capability. Same thing with, with, uh, with, with ground infantry. Shouldn't some of that begin to change and evolve? Yeah, I think, I think it is, is going to evolve. And you, you take a look at uh, the systems that we're developing. You know, I keep coming back to, you know, the speed of the systems that that we need, the range of the systems we need, and this concept of convergence, where we bring together um, the sensors and shooters uh, that are out there, and we're actually executing that right now, that, you know, all of a sudden we can provide uh, lethal effects in tens of seconds, uh, vice, um, minutes you know tens of minutes and, and the one thing about you know when we look at the armor force and we look at some of the forces uh that are available um you know recent experience uh with armor which i, I learned about um is is really the value of that in in cities uh if, if you know when i was in the first cav division i saw i got a chance to see how uh, we used armor forces in Sardis City, how we support the Marines in Fallujah with armor forces, how we fought in the Jaff and some of these other uh, cities. And you could go back and, and even look at some of the other uh, battles that we've had with it, uh, over the years. And so what we have to do is make sure we're just not keeping systems for systems sake, but they still have value uh, in, in the future fight that we're looking at. But if we take a look at what we're doing uh, with, with systems, the reason we're, we're bringing on new long range precision fires is because we want that speed and we want that range. The reason we're bringing on a, a next generation combat vehicle to replace uh, the Bradley uh, is because that's going to change how we operate with that system. We're doing a lot of things with man on man teaming and unman on man teaming. We're doing a lot of things with artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles because that's going to change how we do business. We take a look at uh, the helicopters we have, we have the greatest helicopters in the world, but uh, Future Vertical Lift is really about aircraft that provide significantly more uh, range uh, and speed than we had before. And so most of our systems that we're developing are really across the six modernization priorities are taking advantage of the technology and they're giving us the edge and the overmatch that we think we need for the future. And what we've found is when we've done simulation experimentation, we take our multi-domain operations of, of fighting and then we, we take our new organizations that we have we take the modernization priorities we put them all together that's when we get the overmatch uh, that we need we don't get it by just doing one of those three things we have just a minute remaining and i, I want to ask you quickly uh, a question about the human side one of the takeaways from this last 20 years is the enormous value that special operations forces have especially in partnering as I've seen in, in Syria and uh, other battlefields that I've been lucky enough to cover. Uh, just briefly, General McConville, do you think the, the Army needs to have more of that Special Operations Force uh, capability? You led the way with your Special Forces, the Green Berets. You need to do more of that. 
Well, I think we're doing both. I think we've got tremendous talent on Special Forces. They have done an incredible job uh, over the last 20 years. Absolutely amazing job. But one of the things the Army has stood up, and this is not in competition uh, with Special Forces, but Security Force Assistance Brigades. Uh, you asked the question, what have, we have, what have we learned early on uh, in discussion is the importance of countries being able to buy their own security. And, you know, and, and really what that comes to is a professional military that's trusted uh, by their people. And we've set up security force assistance brigades. There's one for each combatant commander. They're out operating right now and, and very, very small teams working with the Army to professionalize it, which is different than what our special forces do, who provide incredible uh, capability developing small uh, small size units uh, and also developing special operations for, for these various countries. So there's tremendous synergy going together on how we improve the, the overall capacities and capabilities of our partner. We want them serving side by side. That's where you get the, the strength uh, of the military. And really, that's how you get peace through strength. I've seen those security assistance uh, brigades training. I, I think it was in in Louisiana, uh, and it was uh, it was it was fascinating. That, I'm sure that's part of the future. So, uh, General McConville, I want to thank you for thinking with us. As I, as I said at the outset, it's a little bit about the present and present dilemmas, but but also laying out uh, your vision in the armies about ways you want to change, adapt to new technologies, and think about, uh, about, about the world of 2035. Uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us and, and, uh, and talking about these dilemmas. Th thank, thanks for being with Washington Post Live. Oh, and thanks for having me. So uh, we'll be uh, back. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Capehart, will interview the uh, founder and CEO of the uh, food company, Chobani, at two o'clock today. And on Wednesday, I'll be talking to Admiral Bill McRaven uh, about a new book he's published. It's been 10 years since Admiral McRaven led the raid on Osama bin Laden at Abbottabad uh, that we all remember. Uh, so I hope you'll, you'll join us for that on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning into Washington Post Live today.